Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. Welcome to The Laws of Style, podcasting to you from the offices of HBA, high above Bryant Park in the Garment District of New York City. I'm your host, Douglas Hand, fashion lawyer and fashion law professor, and I'm joined today by actor, author, and activist about town, Alec Baldwin. <laughs> Alec, thanks for joining us I'm today. I'm going to put that on my business card, activist yeah. about town. It's, it, it might require two lines. Um, well, so perhaps little known fact, but um, back in your George Washington days in college, as a political science major, as a guy who was active in student politics, you had aspirations of becoming a lawyer. Mm-hmm. What happened? Well, it's interesting you say that because it's a long time ago. And back in that time, <clears throat> I was at GW, and I'll put this as succinctly as I can. I'm in, uh, I'm working as an intern in the office of this guy, Jerry Ambro, who was the congressman from my home district. Okay. And as is often the case when you arrived at one of those schools, AU, Catholic, Howard, for that matter, or mm-hmm. GW, uh, you, uh, you wound up doing internships in some aspect of the government. And an internship on the Hill was very common. I got one, and I was there because uh, I was from his district. And uh, uh, someone said to me, you know, there's a glut of lawyers now. You know, you're going to graduate college, undergrad in 1980, and the kind of, not novelty, but the kind of value of a law degree mm-hmm. had gone down. And he had guys that were legislative aides working on salaries of like 60 grand. They were on his staff and handling legal related matters for him for very, you know, uh, humble salaries because there was a glut of people with law degrees. Right. And at that, right at that moment, that intersected with someone saying to me, You should audition for the acting program at NYU. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of in my life, but I did it. And they gave me a full need-based scholarship. I needed the money to go to school. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think they gave me the scholarship and invited me to come to the program because I was the only straight guy that was in the whole class. Right. And uh, uh, and that was the beginning of that. Oh, wow. Well, um, you've obviously interacted with lawyers, probably more lawyers than, than you care to have <laughs> interacted with. Um, but eventually, you got to play one in an early role. Um, and, you know, you were a brash district attorney prosecuting the murderer of Medgar Evers. Mm-hmm. In- Ghosts of Mississippi. In that role, you were obviously dressed as a Southern attorney. I guess walk me through the process as an actor of wardrobe and who question. makes the choices? Do you have any ability to sway those choices? And then how you feel, and in particular playing a DA in that kind of a setting, in the clothes and how well, they I informed think, that? <clears throat> well, I think that's a very good question because I think that um, obviously things in all matters in terms of my approvals were different when I started. And then once you become more well-known and you're someone that they want to attract you to come and do the project, they uh, assume you want to have some input. And then finally, you get to the stage where you actually know something. You know, you actually warn a lot of these different designers that we can have the lengthiest conversation about the arc of designers that I've uh, collaborated with from the beginning and 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 uh, and costume designers who and are by working. designers do you mean <clears throat> commercial designers or I mean one, it- one, one time in the 80s you're wearing nothing but Armani mm-hmm. then after that I'm wearing nothing but Chiruti then after that I'm wearing nothing but Zenya and that was in collaboration with the actual brand some uh, rep from the brand reaching out to you saying we want you in Chiruti well the um uh You know, once I could afford to buy the clothes I wanted to buy, and I went on that journey, uh, um, you know, I bought, you know, what 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 advertising sold to me. When I I was marketed like anybody else, I mean, Armani was the colossus that bestrode the globe there in the '80s. Uh, uh, That was the beginning 
<clears throat> of uh, uh, in American Gigolo and Richard Gere and that mm -hmm. product placement thing. Armani, a, a woman named Wanda McDaniel, who is the wife of a, um, a famous producer, uh, Albert Ruddy, who produced The Godfather. Wanda McDaniel opened up the Armani office in Beverly Hills to do the product placement for Armani in the film and television business back in the 80s maybe even the late 70s. And, and that, that was the beginning of that. And, yeah, and uh, very prescient. I mean, you know, <clears throat> it, it, it's gone to probably absurd lengths where you have a film like The Great Gatsby where Brooks Brothers did an outright collaboration mm -hmm. with the film where you could buy everything from the film and they used the Baz Luhrmann sort of background in everything in connection with selling it at Brooks Brothers locations. It was well, there's, there, there's a distinction, which you're obviously aware of, but for the people listening, there's a distinction between a celebrity endorsement of a line of some famous actor wearing the clothing of a designer promotionally, and then the uh, the participation of the, of the designer in the production of the film. So now, for example, where the industry is attempting to cut costs at every corner, right. you have far less of that. Mm -hmm. You have far less of them walking in and saying, we're going to dress every, all of the male leads in Ocean's Eleven. Maybe they have some of that with those guys because they're very, very famous actors. And they'll say, we'll give you uh, 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 some percentage, a discount. I did a television show for seven years, and we wore almost exclusively <clears throat> uh, uh, 80% Xenia, and the other 20% was divided between Brooks Brothers and Brioni. And I'm talking about shoes, ties, pocket squares, everything, you name it. Because my character was a, was a serious businessman. And I had, uh, by the time the show was over after seven years, I had a room, uh, you know, the size of a gymnasium almost filled right. with suits. What show is this? Oh. Right, 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 right. We did 30 <laughs> Rock. And, uh, and, I, and what was my favorite part of that, you know, you dress well, uh, 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 from a professional standpoint every day. For me, I went to work. I put on a suit and tie, a beautiful suit and tie every day. And when the show was over, I kept the clothes on and went out to dinner with my friends. Smart. I would just wipe my makeup <laughs> off and get in my car and go to a dinner on the Upper East Side right over the br a bridge from uh, um, Silver Cup in Long Island City. And I wore the clothes at the door and I'd bring them back in a shopping bag the next day. We had a bunch of shopping bags in the trunk of the car. Did you bring all of them? <clears throat> I always, oh, I always, yeah, I always okay. brought the clothes. Right. clothes always. I, I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, shoplift ever from the show. And so those brands, all they really got, did they get any, you know, in the credit roll? Were they mentioned? That's, that's another thing where, where, you know, sometimes there are productions that I've worked with where you do give them a screen credit. Uh, other times, you know, they have a policy now, uh, some of the networks, especially in television, because they have so many, there's so much square footage in TV. There's so many shows and there's so many, particularly actresses. I mean, actresses are far more insistent and far more demanding about what they wear and right. who. I mean, that, that's really the business. Yeah. And, and the men are like, if you walked into a room that was the product placement room uh, in some metaphor for film and television, especially television, it might be, uh, 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 you, know, you know, 150 tables of women's clothing and one table of men's right. clothing. Right. The, the money to be made is in influencing the, the buying decisions of women in, in film and television, not so much men. But for me... <clears throat> I found that they're very stingy with all of it now, with what they want to spend. They, they're not quite sure it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Because years ago, and I wish I, I wish I knew this name, I forgot the name, but you know, years ago, all of the networks and the studios warehoused their, their wardrobe. And then it became, it wasn't cost effective anymore. So they wound up taking the clothes and some guy, this is the guy I'm forgetting, uh. walked in and said, Get, he walked in. He'd assess the wardrobe. Just sort of make what's, you what's, an offer. What, what's the square footage and the weight? He'd walk and... in and make you an offer. Wow. Dresses, gowns, bags, right. shoes, belts, you name it. He'd walk in and say, I'll give you 10 grand for the whole thing. With and legacy. They'd say, take it. With legacy to it as well. And they'd say, take it. Yeah. And they'd sell him the clothes. And then he'd sell it in an aftermarket in a shop. Right. And did quite well, actually. I, I don't doubt it. Yeah. Well, on the sponsorship of film or TV. I mean, how do you feel about that? How would you feel being involved in a film where part of what was there was a walking advertisement? How would you feel as the Bond character looking at your Omega and recognizing that not only you, but the producers and the world knows that Omega has underwritten the film and, and this part of 
your interaction with your audience is is completely underwritten in an ad. I think that that I don't know all of the ins and outs when you use that as, as an example, which is a very good example. If Daniel Craig is wearing an Omega watch, I'm assuming that Omega has paid uh, uh, Daniel Craig something, obviously. But I think what it also is is, it, is that the film producers view it as promotion for the film. There, there's okay. some value to them. Um, the biggest movie stars of today, Craig, uh, uh, Leo, and people like that, uh, Cruz, they don't wear anything that they don't want to wear. No one's walking up to them and saying, you know, we really have a great deal with Herman Schlerman here who's going to make your clothes. <clears throat> That's just out of the question. Okay. And in the case of Cruz, I think Cruz uh, probably has all of his clothes custom made. Custom. I, I wouldn't doubt that. Yeah. Um, I think... You bring up Daniel Craig. Mm -hmm. He is associated, at least in my mind, and I think many consumers' minds, as a suited guy mm -hmm. because of his because he's Bond. Um, he's 007. 007. I think maybe with the exception of, of John Hamm, who through Mad Men became very associated with being the suited guy, I think the mind goes to you. Mm -hmm. I think the consumer's mind goes to you. Your... Your film roles, as I went through them, I was like suit, 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 from Married to the Mob mm -hmm. to uh, Blue Jasmine. Mm -hmm. You know, you're the suited guy. And then obviously Jack, Jack Donahue, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he is the avatar yes. of the suited management elite. He was. Um, did those roles seek you? I'm, how did you become the suited guy? Well, it's funny you say that. <laughs> well, I think for me, the interesting thing is that the uh, you mentioned before we were talking about those approvals and those consultations and so forth. It, it is indeed consultations. Then you move over to approvals uh, outright. But you you learn like uh, some of uh, when I did films early on, and I was being introduced to uh, clothing by someone like Colleen Atwood, one of the great Academy Award winning, probably one of the greatest uh, costume designers of all, um, <clears throat> you know, up there in the top five ever. And I would do some of her earlier films. Uh, she worked with Jonathan Demi, and I did Marry to the Mob with them. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, thing, the things you get into is what goes with what compared to men that I knew in my life that passed on to me their code. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd say, I mean, I, I literally did a, uh, my first TV show was, with a so was a soap opera with a man who played my father who was a very old guard New Yorker who said to me, uh, uh, no pattern tie with a striped shirt. Mm -hmm. He said, no brown or saddle colored shoes with a gray suit. He said, go get yourself some cordovan, some ox blood shoes with mm -hmm. the gray suit. He had these rules that he imparted to Early me. laws of style. <clears throat> he, he had, no, seriously, he had yeah. laws of style. Yeah. And they just stayed with me forever. Now I would go work with other people and they talked to me about designers in terms of weight of fabrics. Armani made clothes in the 80s and they were beautiful clothes, but the fabric was very weighty. And mm -hmm. so you couldn't wear those suits in the, in the warmer weather. And... Uh, uh, Xenia is renowned for these, as I say, multi-saison uh, uh, suits they wear that are like the perfect weight they can kind of transfer right. either way. Uh, Brioni, uh, 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 I like the weight, although if you get like a really satiny finish with them, it's a little papery. It's like the jacket's kind of flying yeah, it, all over it, me. It, like, and, and a little <clears throat> shiny, can be a little shiny after the first dry cleaning. And, and, that's, and that's what you say, and I'd be interested to get your input into this. Every part I play, I say, how much does this guy want to draw attention to himself? Okay. How much does the character, is he a peacock? Mm -hmm. Do I want to wear Italian suits that are a little brighter, that pop a little more, and the colors and so forth? Uh, do I want to wear any jewelry or, or what have you, rings and things like that? And do I want to play a guy who is more uh, uh, muted? And then, then you pick different palettes. And wardrobe <clears throat> gives you that leeway? How does it work with wardrobe? Do you go in and they say, Alec, here's what you're wearing? If it's a show that they have money... Uh, uh, where they have a budget for clothing uh, of any kind, uh, the designer starts by months prior because the shopping is a, is a journey for them. They send you, uh, the classic thing now is called the lookbook. They send you a lookbook, okay. a file, and then they email you. And all they send you are 
lifts from other ads. They send you pictures from advertisements and catalogs and things and say, now this Burberry and this, we thought about this in the, in the, in the, in the, in the classic Burberry trench coat. Mm-hmm. We thought about this in a, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a herringbone. We thought about these boots. Whatever it is, they're sending you photographs, like lots and lots of photographs. And, but eliciting <clears throat> your, I mean, they want you comfortable in the clothes. The clothes are like every other component of the, of the project for the actor, or hopefully are, and perhaps more so than others. I mean, they might be toward the top three of what you call the kind of authentication of the role, mm-hmm. meaning what do those men really wear? You go to court and you watch mm-hmm. what men wear. And you go to court and watch what men wear who don't have a lot of money for clothes. Are you playing a rich guy? Right. Are you Richard Gere and Pretty Woman? And it's the guy's got. They're going to make him look perfect all the time. Are you a guy where he's? I'm not going to say threadbare, but he's a little more normal. You know. Yeah. Uh, 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 so you begin this process by examining who the guy is. You get in. You have that conversation with the designer. Uh, uh, you have uh, the the lookbook shows up. Then you walk into a room, and the, and, the, and the final phase I find usually not always is you put on some clothes and they take pictures of that. Then they send that to the director. Okay. They don't bother the director with it until they have narrowed it down to a to a, a, a some ideas. Well, so I would love to go through some of these roles, sure, and get your take on not only how your apparel choices and wardrobes apparel choices informed how you acted the role but also how the clothes, a- after those choices were made, perhaps informed it. Um, you, you may not think of this as much as, you know, sort of a suited, but Hunt for Red October. Right. You were dressed phenomenally right. in that film. And maybe that's just my pension for the navy blue, you know, right. the, the, the ability to have epaulets, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there are even shots of you in a white roll neck sweater. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look magnificent in that film. How did you feel in those clothes? And you were acting opposite, you know, the first Bond. 007. 007. <laughs> the 007. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and <clears throat> how did that interaction and the way he presented himself, which is always tight. Well, right? that's what a, you know, that's the first big film I ever appeared in. I did other films in supporting roles. But that was the first lead role I had in a big budget film. And the film was, you know, pretty successful for them. And I remember... Uh, uh, you know, the overwhelming majority of people uh, are in uniform there. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a military film. We go outside there and Richard Jordan is in a, uh, you know, when you're going with James Earl Jones or Richard Jordan and the other uh, civilian characters there in suits and ties, muted. I mean, everything, very yeah. the, the palette is very gray and blue. And uh, um, the, uh, and we, which is why to this day, I love Brooks Brothers. Love. I mean, I, I to this day, I, 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 uh, the shirt I'm wearing right now, I'm wearing a blazer from Ralph. Okay. I'm wearing a tie from Zinnia and a shirt from Brooks Brothers. Okay. And so, I mean, I, I just, I, I tried to touch every base here for you. <laughs> but, uh, and I have a, you know, a Brioni, you know, the, 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 and Zinnia, those are my palette. But the, the um, mostly because of the weight of the fabric, I like it if it's not too heavy. But um, I love Brooks Brothers. I love Brooks Brothers and, and, and th- things that are a little more quiet when. You know, I'm in that mood. I, I rarely wear clothes now that are too. If I have, uh, you know, 150 ties, I used to have 400 ties, and then when I moved with my wife downtown, we decided I had to get rid of half my shirts right. and half my. T- I lived alone. I was divorced, and I had 400 shirts and I had 400 ties. Yeah, that's it's hard to make closets. use of 400 shirts. And it was all stuff know. that was given to me from films and so forth. So I would, uh, I went through it all. And at the Century Association, the Century Club that I belong to, they had until recently a, a requirement to wear a tie. Mm-hmm. You still have to wear a jacket, but you no, they relax the tie. So I donated 200 of my ties, half my ties, to the oh, Century Club. We call it the Alec Baldwin Tie Museum. And you can <laughs> avail yourself of a tie there. But I think that uh, for me, the people that I met, the, the men that I knew, designers or otherwise, who were influencing me when I had enough money to go buy some clothes discretionary that way, it was all about being quiet. Paul Stewart, Brooks, mm-hmm. um, and uh, uh, and in Hunt for Red October, that was a movie where I came in and literally just saluted and said aye aye to whatever they told me. They dyed my hair, they mm. cut my hair. I sat in a chair and it was like I was a car. Your hair is sort of undeniably black. My had my, my hair. Film. I had dark hair. 
and they dyed my hair, you know, two or three times to get it the way they were, the director. And they talked about me like I wasn't even, like I was a horse. Mm-hmm. You know, I just was sitting there and they were like, I think maybe. Burr, 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 but they'd be I think that's the assumption for many of us that actors like models are treated in that way unless they've achieved a certain degree well, of, then con- hey, I'm, I'm going to put in my contract that I've got You some, get there. You get yeah. there. For me, this was early on. And then Connery walked in. And I remember, you know, he wore a hairpiece. Uh, he wore a the perfect hairpiece. It was it was well, it was, and he had the perfect beard. For he that was too. the guy walked in, and I Full always make a joke. Silverback. About, I mean, he walked in, and I always make this joke, but I mean it sincerely. I remember the first day we shot, he walked in because he'd been ill and he wasn't going to do the film. Okay. And then he was recovered. He had some kind of throat condition, and he recovered, and he shows up. So we didn't have a lot of time. I mean, he kind of parachuted in to get going. And he shows up, and he's in wardrobe, and I thought, I gulped. I said, no one's ever going to see me in this movie. I'm going to become invisible. Look at how perfect. The guy is perfect, and he had his clothes cut perfect. Right. One time at the end of the film, there's a scene at the end of the film. It is one of the fi- it's the final scene of the film, and we shot it earlier on, and we're on the con. We're on the, the, the deck of the submarine going toward America. And the moonlight is bathing us. It's this very kind of uh, romantic lighting. And when we're shooting the scene, he said to me, uh, he said, uh, I said, this jacket you're wearing is just stunning. I said, yes, it's a leather blue chant jacket that they had custom made for me for the film. I said, my God, it's stunning. I said, this is one of the most beautiful jackets. He said, I'll have them make you one. I'll tell the wardrobe department to make you one right away. Everyone must have a leather blue song jacket in their wardrobe. <laughs> and I thought to myself, here's another man <laughs> right. teaching me the laws of stuff. Sean Connery himself is saying, you must have a leather blue song jacket in your wardrobe. Yeah. And indeed, I got one. He got to make me one. Wow. He was a great guy. He is a great guy. He's lovely. Well, were there, given our vintage, mm-hmm. given the films that we've watched in our youth, often we were greeted with the suited man, you know, Cary Grant. And the, were there any style icons for you as you were a young actor or today um, that you still think of as, God, I want to channel that, that look? You know, it's, it's interesting because you press a lot of buttons there. You know, you think about people said that, people said that, uh, they said that Adolf Monju had a shoe closet that would be the envy of, uh, uh, you know, um, Imelda Marcos. Imelda Marcos. Manjou apparently had the shoe closet there in Beverly Hills. It was like, you know, uh, 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 enviable. Um, I think of people who wear clothing um, and who dress well uh, on camera and off camera. People tend to want to be a little bit more, you know, they want to be a little less uh, um, flashy and not be too... uh, 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 precious about their clothes in public when they're off camera. Mm-hmm. A lot of movie stars dress down, and they're wearing a hoodie, and they're wearing a t-shirt, and they're right. wearing a, uh, a, you know, some kind of a, 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 you know, some clothing. You know who's a very good dresser, and I've seen f- photographs of him, and he's very uh, his visual acumen is something that is um, is amazing. He's so smart, and, and of course, of course, he's the son of a painter. Is De Niro is a very well dressed man. Okay. When De Niro dresses up, he always looks really, really perfect. He wore beautiful clothes, and from the old days, <clears throat> I would say, um, uh, I would have to guess uh, a guy who I always thought was just so handsome. And the clothes were, it, it, it was a guy that embraced his handsomeness, was Tyrone Power. Okay. I always yeah. thought Tyrone Power just looked immaculate yeah. in yeah. every movie he was in. Yeah. Well, yeah. Probably wasn't hard for him, but no, still. He did have know. an advantage. Yeah. yeah. Well, so back to some of the films. Um, you know, and, and there are so many where you are the suited man. Um, you know, The Cooler, amazing performance. Mm-hmm. Thank you. You know, you're a fucking Monster. casino boss. Right, yeah. I'm a pit boss. How did, yeah. how did it feel having to sort of put on clothes that you wouldn't have worn? Or The Departed, where, you know, you've played a lot of cops, mm-hmm. right? You've played a lot of mm-hmm. government men, Mission Impossible, mm-hmm. where perhaps the style quotient is at zero. Does that 
help you inhabit the role or is that an I'm impediment not... because you feel like, hey, I, I just look bad right now? I, I, mean, I mean, I've worked with Bob Ringwood on The Shadow and I've worked with Colleen Atwood on, uh, uh, on some films. I've worked with some of the greatest costume designers in the world. And uh, I'll never forget Bob Ringwood. I did the movie The Shadow, and he made an overcoat for me, which was literally, you felt like it was like from the drapery of the Plaza Hotel. It was the heaviest fabric I've ever worn. It was like this almost Russian. Right. You thought we were going to be shooting the film on location, outdoors in Moscow. Yeah. It was such a heavy, bulky coat, and I still have it to this day. I will never part with this coat. It's the most beautiful Why don't you wear it in out? cold weather. Well, you know, it's got to be very cold out. You've yeah, be very but cold still, out. I mean, you know, yeah. red carpet season. I, I, be... I, 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 may, I may take up your if advice. You, if you come to the FIT benefit again, that's what you should Joanna do. Johnston on Mission, when I did the first one that I did, Rogue Nation, uh, number five, I guess it was, I went to meet with her, and she was the loveliest woman I've ever worked with in my life and she would just sit there and and she and I it was it was, it was I would have married her if I was if I was single she would just sit there with the clothes and just finger the jack and go I think that's rather nice don't you and I go yes I love this she was going to make that for you I'm going to have all your shirts made and this and thus and thus and thus and it was just the most it was luxuriating in the fittings yeah. with this woman and then we were done I always say to them you know, what can I pay you? They'll say you the clothes at, at like half the cost. Or I said, I'll take it all. I mean, she made me such beautiful suits. And she wouldn't got a suitcase for me. She wouldn't have the, the wardrobe department get, you know, an inexpensive, like a real ballistic type of suitcase. It was tough. And she had all the clothes. We waited until the movie wrapped. You had to right. wait until the movie was, until the producers approved the sale. In case you had to go back and reshoot. And then this suitcase arrived with all my clothes that I had bought from them for Mission Impossible Part 5, Rogue Nation. They're my, some of my favorite suits I've ever owned in my life. Nice. Another one I did was, was when Zenya had their anniversary, Gildo Zenya, the son of yeah. the founder or the grandson, said, we're going to make, uh, I, want, I, like, I want to make uh, this suit from the fabric of the first year of the company. We're going to recreate. We're going to remanufacture the fabric. He shows me the suit. And he says, this is, I'm going to make one for you and one for me. And we wear it to the party, the grand the, the, uh, celebration. And they made this suit for me that was like the first uh, round of Zen. I mean, I've had so many thrilling moments like that. No, that's an amazing one. Well, I mean, you obviously, global traveler, both work and pleasure. Well, I can, yeah. Let's, um, what city do you feel has the most stylish men? That's a great question. Because there's two answers, I think. I went to Madrid. And you could tell in the European tradition that a man will go out and buy himself a nice blazer, a couple of them, and a couple of nice pairs of shoes and platform everything off of that, as you know better than I do, where people, there's like a, there's like a, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a foundation you, you build you, on. You, the foundation to build on, and those are two extremely important You pieces. see men walking around Madrid in a beautiful camel hair or a beautiful tweed, uh, you know, a, a herringbone or whatever, and they don't have a lot of money. So they just wear a white shirt and a necktie, all of it very simple. Uh, I would say there, and I would say uh, the place where people were the most, well, the place where the women were the most well-dressed, I have to shift to that, was Paris. Yeah. When I was in Paris, I went into a confectionery shop once, and I thought, which one of these women do I ask to go to dinner with me? The mother, the daughter, or the grandmother? <laughs> all three of them. Right. Seventy. Yeah, thirty-five, and with independent and charm. Actually, it was the, the, it was actually like eighteen, fifty, and seventy-five. I would have dated any one of them. They yeah. all were just dressed impeccably. Their clothes. French men as well, and in Paris. Wait, I mean, which, what do you thing, think? What's your answer? It's Milan. You do. It's Milan. For I, me. I like, yeah. But I will say Madrid, having having been there fairly recently, um, one of the things I love about those Spanish towns is how everybody goes out. And just just gets out of their home and strolls, and I think because of that, there is that sense of occasion that comes with wanting to appear not just respectable but have a little bit of style to it. So whether it's that gentleman who has a little pocket square and you know has a pipe that maybe is a little affected, along with those basics that he wears, um, you see that more. In Europe, and particularly what all, where you know where, where the climate affords you more opportunity to get outside more regularly, 
like the Mediterranean countries? I think that with the, you know two things come to mind. One is that uh, the place that I visited years ago, I haven't been there in eons, but the place that I visited years ago where you could tell that a nice dark suit, every man was basically dressed the same, but a nice you know subtle tie, white shirts only, no 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 uh, uh, colored shirts. Um, and this didn't pertain to people who were delivering packages and, and uh, serving you your food. But in restaurants and bars and everywhere, Tokyo was the place where the, mm. where the uniform of the Tokyo businessman was. I mean, everybody wore the same thing. Yeah. I mean, these guys, they were like, this is it. If, you're, yeah. if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you come to play in, in, the, in, the, in the field of business in Tokyo, they all wore dark suits, yeah, beautiful suits, beautiful right. suits. And then the other thing that comes to mind is just this... Uh, I love to hear your take on this. I really mean this, and that, that is the relaxation of the dress code here in the U.S. Not that people are wearing the gap or what have you, but it's the, the idea that, that we've come to a point now, it may be changing, it may be reversing itself, but there was a period of about maybe 10 years ago where I thought, it's like the uniform of the Chinese Communist Party. Every guy's wearing an untucked shirt and a pair of khaki pants and a blue blazer, and they don't look very good. Right. And men who are dressed the way you're dressed now but when I lived up on Central Park West and most men were walking out the door every morning to go to work dressed like you are now, mm-hmm. where I live now downtown and where you used to live, you don't see a lot of suit and tie guys down there at all. You don't. Well, yeah. you are ensconced in, you know, a creative class corridor. Yep. And you guys can dress however you want. And in a lot of ways, I think there is a signaling in that casualization that I'm the one with the power. The guy in the suit, maybe my agent in your case, right. maybe my lawyer, maybe my accountant or my banker, but he has to wear the suit, and I can wear the hoodie. That's interesting. And so I oh, think hoodie. there's, yeah, there's the, oh, well, horrible. I mean, the hoodie is, is the uniform of, 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 you know, what I'll say is sort of that, uh, you know, internet creative class, right? You know who the internet venture capital backed guy is, right? He strolls in in, in the hoodie That's a good point. Um, and some performance pants or whatever. Um, I think the casualization of the workplace is a challenge for men. Um, it was very easy to put the suit on with a white or blue shirt and a tie. I mean, it's friggin' Garanimals. 80% of your frontal presentation is covered already. It matches. Right, so it's 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 a lot easier if you're starting to pair separates, and even with a drive to not wear an odd jacket or blazer, but actually go with, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and wear a knit, but still look really professional. That's hard. That's mm-hmm. hard. A lot of guys need coaching on that. A lot of guys need to read the laws of style <laughs> on that. Um, so I think it's an opportunity for brands because a lot of guys would get those four Brooks Brothers suits and be done for five days of the week. And then, you know, what they wore casually was what they wore casually. Today, that guy is looking at five days of the week where he may not wear a suit any of those days because it's like, what, do you have a client coming in? Are you going to court today? Um, Most workplaces, including, you know, some of the big investment banks are casual all week. And the law is one of those few areas where, for instance, to go to court, you got to be suited up. Yeah. You got to have a tie on. Uh, but those places are really um, are really eroding. I mean, I wonder if our grandchildren will look back at this time and, and say, "God, you know, we're dad or grandfather or great grandfather. You know, we're we're were you really that lazy? You know." So I bemoan it a little bit with reference to you know those older gentlemen in European capitals that um, mm-hmm. that have that sense of occasion, even if it's just going out on a Thursday night to stroll or walk the dog. You're, you're right about Milan, too. I, I didn't mean to omit Milan because cause I, I, when I went to Italy for the first time, uh, when I was a bit older, I hadn't been there, I was 30 in 1988, and I, I, I landed in Milan because I had to do business there. And then I went to the Via Borgo Nuovo where the, uh, uh, the mm-hmm. Maison for Armani was there. Yeah. And I had an introduction to somebody there, and it was beautiful because I ordered my suits, got fitted for my suits, then went over to uh, uh, Venice, then went to Florence, and then came back to pick up my suits when they were ready and take them home with me. But but I have two questions for you. One is yes. that um, um, what was the? Uh, I'll, I'll get to my pet peeve in a second. But I have one fashion pet peeve. Okay. I have only one, and that is I. First of all, I don't own any jeans. I don't own okay. any jeans at all. I view jeans as a component for 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 myself. Other men. 
uh, can wear jeans till uh, uh, to the, the end of time. But for me, jeans are men lunging to look younger. When I see older men wearing jeans, yeah, and another thing is, is is older men wearing baseball caps. Now, if you don't have a, a, if you don't have an enviable head of hair, if you're missing your hair, and there's a bit of that insecurity, uh, I get that. But when I see men in their 40s and 50s wearing baseball caps, I want to scream. I can't yeah. stand the baseball capped man. Yeah. Not well, kid, in particular, in particular, backwards or oh, don't anywhere even, yeah. but backwards, the cap actually. I want to. I, I want to leave. Town. Yeah, you got to be behind the plate with a breast protector on if you're going to yeah. wear your cap. You're going to be getting paid a lot of money. Yeah. Now, now, now the, the, but, but the other thing was, what I wanted to ask you was, where was the, uh, what was the clothing uh, regimen in your childhood? Did you grow up with dad, everyone in your life, well-dressed, suit and ties, professional people? Um, well, I grew up in Laguna Beach, California. Right, nice town. So, extremely casual. But not suit and tie, yeah. Not a suit What'd your dad do? Place. My dad was in the insurance industry. Suit and tie? You played, oh God, along came Polly. Good stuff. Uh, good yeah, thoughts, Shelley. Good stuff, Shelley. But that is great role. yeah. Great. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but my dad was a suited guy every day. Right. You know, and so I in saw Laguna, that. In Laguna, he went to work or you had to go to L.A.? He, he went to work. So he was up in L.A. He was in Santa Ana. Um, and he was an entrepreneur. He, he developed something within the insurance industry that was a service providing sort of doctor evaluations. It's, it's terribly boring, but it was, it was very lucrative. Mm -hmm. and, and he was, uh, you know, uh, way ahead of his time in that. Um, and I think part of why he was taken seriously as a, as a, as a relatively modest and uneducated, I mean, my dad graduated high school, we think, <laughs> we think, um, it seem to was hurt. the way he presented himself. He always wore suits and he often got them from secondhand places. Um, his brother was an actor. He got a lot of cast at Brett Halsey, uh -huh. who you'd have to go way back, but Godfather three, he was, um. He was Diane Keaton's uh, husband in Godfather Three. Oh, really? I don't know that he has a speaking line, but because um, I know you were maybe going to be in Godfather Three. I I begged and grovel, but I, yeah. they gave the part to Andy Garcia, and that's and I can't. <laughs> well, argue that was with a that. much much bigger part. I can't part. argue with that because Andy Garcia part. is a great actor. But I think you know he was significantly older than my father and kind of informed the way that uh, that he should dress. And so, yes. When did you go to the next level? What happened? It's college? Where did it happen for you that you became? Uh, you know, college was acute. college. I was, um, but I, I think, you know, for me, part of, part of moving from Southern California, where really you had one season, which was a very sort of nice anodyne 82 degrees, and moving to the Northeast. Where did you go to college? I went to Vassar College upstate. Um, that was chilly. chilly and four seasons. And one of the reasons I kind of wanted this four season existence was to, to, to wear a little bit more, to wear sweaters, mm -hmm. to wear, I didn't have any outerwear. When I got there, I had, you know, leather flip flops and, and, and surf t-shirts. Uh, and I think that informed a lot of how I approached things. And then of course, going to law school, knowing one's going to be a lawyer. Now, what time was that in? That was in this great city of New York. Where'd I went you go? to NYU for, you did? Wow. for law school. Um, and uh, I have always felt that people expect to see the lawyer in a suit. Yeah. And first impressions are formed within 30 seconds. So while in 30 seconds there's no way I'm going to convince you or regale you with my understanding of the 34 Act or the latest Supreme Court decision, you are going to make a judgment about my efficiency, about my intelligence based on what you're seeing and hearing initially. Mm -hmm. So why tie a hand behind your back mm -hmm. by not looking like a lawyer? Um, but enough about me. <laughs> but no, but when, you, when you decide you want to go shopping, yeah. one of the interesting things is when you're in New York, um, <clears throat> when you're in New York, it's presumed, and this, I think this was true for a healthy period of time, you can have anything. We're in New York. Right. Like when you're over in Europe, why buy suits and things over in New York? I mean, unless you're going to get them custom made, unless you're on, uh, you know, German Street, or right. you're, uh, yeah. you're at Turnbull and Asser, mm -hmm. or you're in uh, uh, Milan on the Borgo Nuovo or whatever, or uh, in Paris. Why buy these clothes? Because in New York, you could basically get everything, which is not true anymore. Barney's is going out of business. I mean, the market yeah. for, <clears throat> uh, you know, really outstanding men's clothes, it seems to be uh, 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 collapsing. But, um, 
you know, w- w- I still have this hangover. I went to Belfast to shoot a film. And when I was there, I had a chunk of a day off. I shot a couple of days and I was off one day. And I go shopping in the downtown Belfast district. I thought, what's downtown Belfast? I've never right. been here before. And I was staying at a really pretty hotel. And uh, <clears throat> I get to this place and they have this uh, uh, jacket, I like like a men's, uh, you know, uh, blazer, whatever. And the uh, label says Douglas Hayward. And I then do all the research because I really like the clothes. He said, we don't have very much anymore on the Douglas Hayward label. And I start to get, I, I mean, I do what I always do, which is if, I, if, if there's a disc I want to have. Just today, I'm, I'm, this is what a maniac I am. Just today, I spent an hour researching in the car driving around. I spent an hour researching how I could get a copy of Frank Sinatra live in Australia in 1959 with Red Norvo's trio. With a wow. Red Norvo Quartet, where they say That's Sinatra, obscure. they say right. this is one of the greatest live and obscure performances of Sinatra. So when I find something, and I'm jonesing for that, I dig. Yeah. Yeah. So I find out a guy who is a fashion editor in London. I talk to him on the phone. He says, "Well, I believe that the Douglas Hayward label has been passed from here, and they were on Mount Street." And he said, "They're out of business. They've gone completely. They've been shuttered completely, and they're gone." And I get the guy on the phone who bought the rights with his, and they want to resurrect. And I'm flying to London in March or April to meet with them, to work with them, to resurrect. Because Hayward had a shop on Mount Street, and he dressed uh, Michael Caine. He's got all these iconic photographs of him with Michael Caine, him with Roger Moore, him with Steve McQueen. He was the guy that made suits for the British... Oh, those stars. Are, those are three absolute icons. Beautiful yeah. clothes. And I'm going to go meet with them to talk about getting into some kind of a business with them to resurrect the old Douglas Hayward brand. I love it. Yeah, me too. Well, so let's talk a little bit about business. I didn't know that you were doing this. and um, Maybe. You we'll know who your talk. fashion lawyer will be if you yeah, do yeah. it. <laughs> um, it's true. I never thought of that. You've just helped me. I just helped you. Um, Ilaria. Lovely woman but influencer in her own right, as are you. And you guys have been very open with your family life and and sharing. She is uh, a significant figure in terms of personal health and yoga. And to many, that is the very basis, your your lives, the very basis for the beginnings of a lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, both of you having agents, both of you being intelligent people and believing in in your lifestyle as as a healthy one you ever discussed that you ever talked about that is that a dream that you have or an aspiration that you guys have as a family i think that um and this is just my guess now because we talk about it a lot but there's a level of work that she could do i think she would undoubtedly have a, a significant maybe even a phenomenal amount of success at that would require her to spend less time with our kids she tends to be working now on in a very ad hoc way if she's out the door and shooting a project two days in a row that's a lot right she tends to work a couple days a week and then she's home she's home bathing the kids because we have very little children Mm -hmm. and um she has had offers to be a featured guest talking about health and wellness and maternity related things because we have a lot of kids. And uh, she's been offered that many, many times. And she's kind of fielding some offers about that now because I think she'd like to go. Uh, the kids are at school all day now. Right. They're old enough now where they're, they're at school. She may deepen all that. We talked about doing something together. But I wonder with our age difference if it, the demographic gets lost, meaning let her appeal to mothers who are young. Right. I am a bit older than my wife, unfortunately. And uh, the, we, were, we weren't quite sure the two of us together. But she, <clears throat> she's also found herself in that world where uh, people, you know, being married to me to some extent, but also her own presence online. And this online thing, as you know, was just, uh, just uh, uh, remarkable. People send boxes of things to our house every day. Right. And say, here's a handbag, here's some cream, here's some hair th- products. They send her stuff, shoes, things for the kids, in the hope that she will then, if she likes them, Use it display and post them online. Right? right, exactly. Right. Well, you know, 
as the words escaped my lips, I, I, I struggle to think of a married couple or, or even partners who have done this successfully. The only ones I can think of who, who've even done it of note um, are now divorced, I think. Uh, Jennifer Lopez, yeah, Jennifer Lopez and um, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony. Did a large lifestyle collaboration for Kohl's. Mm-hmm. And that wouldn't be my vision for, for you guys. Right. But right. Um, it, it's interesting to think through. It's a great how, idea. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll mention that to her because I, when I look at it, you see people online, couples who, I mean, there's one thing in terms of the monetization or, 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 or coming with some kind of a business model for that. The other thing is that just the the essence of the couple. You know, you see that uh, um, John Legend is someone who I admire endlessly, and his wife is this gorgeous woman who just happens to be very, very funny, and the two of them work social media, mm-hmm. uh, but particularly her, with a huge following, and, 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 they're, and they're kind of a battery. But the essence of it is that Legend has to go off and do the things that make Legend famous, and what he does. Mm-hmm. And for me, <clears throat> there are people, the online uh, beachhead is the only assault they have. For me, that's not the case. I have to go and and really hunker down and do some worthwhile project, which I'm about to start one in March. I have to do something that harkens back to who I am and what I do for that stuff to be valuable, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I, I, when I would ever see Chrissy Teigen and Legend together, I was uh, it, it's mostly her, and he's kind of a featured player in her uh, online stuff, her social media. That's because he's got to go sing and make records right, and, and, right. And, and and stick to that. One of the compelling things I think about their feed as well is it's not so much of a sales vehicle. No, I yeah. mean you can look at other larger influencers like the Kardashians or the Jenners, and their feeds really look like a catalog. Which is what they are. They're, they're, they're very well it, shot, and and that's okay. There's nothing. And who made it an amount of money that I didn't? Think. I mean, my daughter Ireland went to school in Northridge. She went to school in Northridge for ten years with Kendall and Kylie Jenner, and Kylie Jenner was this freckle faced little kid. She was like something that was like an extra out of Annie the musical. <laughs> she was like a little urchin, and now she's worth five hundred million dollars. I mean, yeah. the world is a very a Strange massive, place. massive deal, but yeah. it really proves that um, that that is a marketplace and 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 a valid one. But I think consumers respond or are learning to respond as well to more genuine feeds, and 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 your feeds are are nothing but genuine. I mean, it comes very, very, um, it comes through that that your favorite job is being a dad, and her favorite job is being a mom, and the rest is to support the family and and support endeavors that you love. But where you want to be is home with those kids. Well, I, you know, for me, uh, that uh, the work thing has been so. Uh, the last two years, I mean, I've been busy. I've done things, but I've only done things where uh, typically, not always, every day, but typically, I'm back in the house by five o'clock. I mean, I did a, I tried to do a talk show. I do. I'm about to start a project which is much more work that I'm used to where you're gone for 13 or 14 hours and you work a long day and so forth I want to ask you something before we run out of time because it's yep. almost uh, 1 o'clock yep. I gotta go pick up my kids from school but uh, the uh, <clears throat> the thing I want to ask you is you know uh, I'm a good deal older than you and you're still gleaming and handsome and young and, and uh, <laughs> perfect looking but I'm wondering as you're getting older yourself do you sit there and go like does a year or two go by you sit there and go not gonna wear that anymore Indeed, yes. Yeah, um, and you mentioned jeans. I, I still wear jeans, but I, I find it very curious, the the fascination amongst men with, with always pairing things with jeans. You know, jeans I associate with, with where they originated. I mean, you know, building railroads and, 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 and mining in San Francisco. I mean, that's where Levi's came from. That's, that's, that's how denim became you know, a, a fabric. Mm-hmm. It's not comfortable to sit and practice law in. Um, and, you know, that blue, while it's iconic, doesn't even necessarily go well with, with a lot of other things. Um, but it, you're, you're somewhat prescient. I mean, I, um, I'm a couple of weeks away from turning 50, which is, I, I'm sure was a big moment for you. You don't look a day um, over 40. You know, I, I, you know I, I, shaved the, I shaved the beard, which um, I did want to ask you. I mean, you know, you, you've had stubble, but never really the full beard. 
And when I, I did for a little while when I was did younger. You? I was very young. I used, to have, I used to have the what I call the Smirnoff Vodka Man beard. I had a jet <laughs> black beard. It was really fantastic. Sort of the precursor to the world's most interesting man. Probably. I had a fantastic beard, a very thick, dark beard. But as it got grayer, and my hair is multicolored, my, I, my hair is undyed now, and these vents here are white. And on camera, it's bad. You Literally, your face looks like a, there's like a little halo uh. if they don't light you properly. So when I do a film... We knock this down a little bit with a stick. Okay. We take like a, what's called a rue stick, and they take like a mascara pen, and they kind of like try to horrible color it and knock this down. This fender here, yeah. But the rest yeah. of my hair is now twenty that's different colors because you know, obviously, on camera we all look quite a bit different than uh, than than live. As the as 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 they say, you know, in the age of HD now, it's you you, you need all the help you can get <laughs> in high def. So I, I don't want to let you leave without, you know, we sit here in the garment district, um, a regulated area uh, to building owners that requires that a certain amount of square footage in each building is dedicated to apparel production. Um, now, while apparel production widely considered, like pumping out hundreds of thousands of garments, left the city decades ago. Um, this is still a viable area for brands, uh, for New York City-based brands, to engage in sample production, which is when they prepare the actual bespoke garment, which would then go to a factory, typically overseas, but sometimes here in the U.S. for, for full-scale production. And the reason the garment district is an important area for the design community is it is really a one-stop shop for everything from zippers to fabric to leathers to it's all here you don't need to make a trip to new jersey to check out trim that is maybe leather based and then come back and and go to brooklyn for uh for buttons it's all here um there has been a movement amongst the building owners which you can imagine why um to ease those regulations mm-hmm. to allow buildings to be used for residential purposes mm-hmm. and other commercial like purposes. So, well. um, so this is, in a way, encapsulates the, the, the question of gentrification. Where do you come down as a, as a, as a lifelong New Yorker, really? Um, you know, you've always been in or around here, and I know the city is very dear to your heart. Where, where do you come down on, on issues like that? Maybe not this one specifically, but... Um, you know, do you think it's important for New York to hold on to that legacy of some apparel production, or do you feel free market dictates what it what it will, and you know people should be moving in here? Well, I think that <clears throat> first of all, that's a, a very that's a great question, and, and, and thank you for that vivid um, background. You know, I remember when I first moved to New York uh, in the late seventies, and it was the beginning of the end for Soho. Mm-hmm. And as everybody who lived here knew, you would uh, the city had been holding on to, and their regulations had been protecting manufacturing in the cast iron district of Soho, and uh, down there, people were making types of uh, appliances and you know sewing machines and nuts and bolts, nuts and bolts. factories, yeah. and all the stuff they made down there. And and someone was saying that as this manufacturing was abandoning the city, some people were. Uh, uh, exhorting everyone, saying, well, maybe it'll come back. And then eventually they realized it's not coming back. And they allowed the, and you'd, uh, you'd see uh, just acres of uh, advertisements and so forth that would say fixture fee, fixture fee, fixture fee. You were going into an industrial space mm-hmm. with no plumbing, that would be residential plumbing, and they'd sell you that unit, and you had to pay for the fixture fee separate. Right. They weren't going to put all the plumbing in for you, which was an exorbitant cost for a, a, a home. But thus began the, the, the transformation of Soho into what it's become now, which to me is just unspeakable, which is a, it's a lower Madison Avenue uh, mm-hmm. boutique area. Yeah. I never imagined that. But apropos of where we are now, um, I think that city planning, an accent on the word city, is such where we can't have all of the housing built for people who their life is an Uber ride away from where they're going to go. Mm-hmm. Some of this housing can be built uptown. There are other areas that can be reclaimed and developed <laughs> uptown. Uh, uh, the issue of how, what percentage of that should be affordable housing is, is another issue as well. Mm-hmm. Although I think that the city is going to start to really suffer if we don't have more affordable housing. But uh, it, what's here 
should remain the way it is, I think, because in this case, I think design related, whether it's clothing or not, but design with tech, what have you, could come back to this space and occupy these spaces in terms of office space mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and industrial space, light industrial space, uh, easily. I, I think it would be a huge mistake to broom everybody out of the West 30s at what is classically known as the garment district and, and yeah. send them all somewhere else and turn this into lofts and turn it beautiful spaces, beautiful buildings. Like they flipped residential. I get it. I get that they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the most stunning homes in Manhattan I've ever been into are not on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. They're on Mercer Street and they're, you know, they're downtown in these, uh, you know, 20 foot ceilings and so forth. But I do think that, um, uh, I, I think it would be a huge mistake because what's down there isn't going to change. That's done. What's here, if you lose this, I think we could be in trouble. It yeah. could be a mistake for the economy of the city. Yeah. Well, Alec, that's a wrap. Time is up. <laughs> but um, Thank thanks so much for coming me. in. Yeah. And, you know, any, uh, any, any, uh, we didn't get to talk about your involvement with PETA or, or any other programs that you work well, the with, most but any shout outs for? Well, the most important thing that they hear is when I uh, have my next conversation with these guys, because I'm having, you know, it's casual. We're kind of tiptoeing toward this Douglas Hayward thing. When I have something more concrete, you're my next phone call after I hang up with these guys. You got it. My, oh, no, I mean that literally. You're my and next they'll, phone they'll call. they'll say, Douglas no, 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 no. Or they're, they're Hayworth. Gonna, exactly. The two well, Douglases. The two Douglases. Two Dougs. Thanks so much. Hey. Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Hand of the Law. Thank you for tuning in. And stay stylish.